Okay, my outstanding friends, nothing better than this. Nine experiments that will change your view of light and blow your mind at the same time. This is Astrum. They got like 1.8 million subscribers. They're going to be talking about why nobody understands light. And nobody does. They can't understand light. They don't know what's in the subatomic particles. They don't know how gravity works. They don't understand literally anything about these subatomic particles. As I will show you, and I will show you that I do understand what they're made of, and we can show you right now what they're made of from our experiments that will absolutely blow your mind. Okay, before we get into the double slit experiment, this is a single slit. It's a venturi. It comes down so close together that only half of the electron is allowed through and the half that's allowed through is the glowy part. The part that doesn't glow is pushed back out and as the light spins and you can see it's round and it spins. Light spins in a circle just like a drill bit. So it comes in here and it goes over the top and then under and then over the top and then under. This is what's going on here and as it does it goes this way sometimes they go that way sometimes they come off this way but they hate each other and they will keep these exact separations between these lines so that they don't interfere with each other. This is the true non-interference pattern. They call it an interference pattern because they flap like this and push these waves out as I will show you. That is not the case. The reason they have trouble is because they use big wide slits. We have such a tiny slit here that it only allows half of the electron through. Okay, so now what are you going to say? Well, you're going to say, Roger, what is half of an electron? Well, these are what electrons are, a black and a white together, these two together. This is two electrons together. They're, they call them gluons, I call them electrons. They are the, the two particles, the black and the white, which are these particles, and then when they get together, they form an electron. When two electrons snuggle up to each other, they form a photon. Now when the photon hits the venturi, which is so tightly constricted, only the white, which can get bigger and smaller, squirts through. The black's just too big, can't get through. And here is the actual event occurring. All right, don't forget, this is Fermilab. CERN, they see the same particles. One black and a white are small, a red, green, blue, it doesn't matter. The black is always the same, always, 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 always. Never change the size. Doesn't matter whether you're in the green or the blue or the red range, it doesn't matter. The black is a fixed particle, and this one can get big and get small, and that's why it's allowed to squirt through the venturi. Very, very unusual set of circumstances. Now, as you saw up here, the black one has a glowy edge around it. That's exactly what they say at CERN and Fermilab. And there it is right there. There's the black one with the, f the fuzzy edge around it, and here's the white one, which is the, the glowy particle, which is what's called a point particle. All right, so you have a fixed, but it always has the same color glowiness, which is the color of the light, which in this case is red. If it was green, it would be green. If it was blue, it would be blue. And, but this never changes. And I will show you, I have that same identical particle in green and blue and red. No difference whatsoever, except the speed. The spin is much, much faster for the blue, and then not quite as fast for the green, and then the red is, is slower. Now, this is what a photon looks like. Now, here's what happens at the venture. The particle, that photon, speeds up because it has to. A venture accelerates things. Just look it up. It's, no, it's fully understood. And the particle is being sucked right out of its own magnetic field. And then here it divides and the black separates from the white. Here it is right here. The black no longer can get through that slit. Only the white. It's such an explosion that pushes the black back and the white gets through and the black desperately wants to be together with the white. Actually it's the white that desperately wants to be attached to the black. And the white has been ripped away from the black through that venturi. And that venturi is about the size of that tip of my pinpoint there. It's so tiny that only the white can get through. The black is just too big. The black is just a little bit bigger 
than the Venturi. Can't get through. So only the white gets through. We can actually engineer this so that some of both get through, but not an equal number. Mostly the white will get through and some of the black will follow it and push the white. I'll show you that right now. Okay, pay close attention to this. I originally showed you a wave just beginning to accelerate. The front was just beginning to accelerate. Up in here, there is a ton of these same waves. You just don't see them. They're all over the place. You see them here and here and here and here. They're all over here. Same as this wave here. The only reason you don't see it is not being either pulled forward fast to where it accelerates and brightens up or is being pushed back at and being brightened up like the tips of these waves. All these are is the tip of these waves that have not accelerated enough to become visible but now they're being pushed back at so that the fronts of them are visible all over the place and they are everywhere they're everywhere in the light just just a whole flood of these things now this particular one was exactly dead nuts right through the venturi that's why this particle is taking on all of that energy as it, it builds energy as it comes forward. Anytime you see something glow and get glowier and glowier and glowier, it is getting more and more and more energy. And this, my friends, is energy on steroids. That is a subatomic nuclear explosion. I'm not kidding you. That is nothing more than a subatomic nuclear explosion. The black has separated from the white and then it fuses back together. This is fission, and that's fusion. This tells the story right here. This is CERN and Fermilab. Muon neutrinos are the black balls, and the muon goes on its way when you go into Cheryenkov radiation, which is just what this is. The electrons go into electron showers, which is exactly what happened. The white is the electron, the muon is the black. It separates and stays away. And the only reason we could do this is because we accelerated it, just like they're doing, only what they're trying to do is create this havoc by not pushing them through a Venturi, but slamming them together like this. It's the same, the same effect, but all they see is a batch of debris. We actually squirted the white, and we could squirt it right onto a target. And we can harvest that white, and that's all you want is that white to drive your car or make charge batteries. That is electricity. The white is literally electricity. When the black is attached to the white, it's a particle. It's not electricity. It's a particle. And if you have, the more particles you put together, they turn into protons. The more protons and neutrons you have together, they turn into atoms. The more atoms you have together, turn into molecules. So light is the beginning of everything. It's only everything there is is made of these black and white particles, which I have shown you before are the electron neutrinos and the, the muon neutrinos. All right, see electron neutrino, muon neutrino, black and white. They separate into a sterile muon all by itself and the electron shower. That's, that's top end physics. That is top, over the top of what they're doing at CERN and Fermilab. In addition, we're beyond what they're doing. All right, now I showed you these are the particles. Now, this is the red, and that's from this right here. Now they come red, blue, and green. And here's the green. Same particle. The black part, no difference whatsoever. None, zero. The white part, no difference whatsoever. The only difference is a spin. And what do I mean by that? Well, here's what I mean by that. Red is the spin is way out here. It's spinning very, you know, it's spinning like this, but it's, it's spinning kind of slowly. So you have boom, 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 boom. The particle shows up in all these different spots far apart. And it looks like a wave, but it's not. It's a particle spinning. Now green is down here. Very fast, very powerful. Blue is like that. And when you get hit by blue, you know you've been hit. Now you see the red, how far apart the waves are? The green, they'd be here and here and here and here and here and here and here. The blue, they'd be just like that. You wouldn't even be able to tell there was 
well, I'll show you the blue in a second. But these are phases of neutrino. A neutrino means you're not quite up to photon yet. You're building up energy. And why are you building energy? Because you're pushing against other fields. And really the neutrinos get this style and then they go into this style as they get stronger and then they get photons as they approach the Venturi because they're being pushed back at. The photons you normally don't see until they actually bounce back from what they're interfering with. When they bang into something, they bounce back. Then you see the photon. We're seeing the photons because we've accelerated them. It's the same as bouncing back, but we're pushing hard into what that is bouncing back. So we see them way out here. Normally, that's just, you're never going to see that. It's just never been seen before. Now, the green is the identical situation. You have the same neutrinos building up, and then you see the photon. This one here, and they spin. As the four leading one charges up, the back one discharges. But once it gets a certain charge, it gets real heavy duty and then it flips to the back. Then the uncharged one comes to the front. We can see this better in the, uh, the red. You see the red here? You got the, the white sticking out in front here. Uh, down here, the white's at the bottom. This is up spin, down spin. And all that means is it's a charge, the top one's charged up so much that it flips and now the bottom one comes out in front and starts to accept the charge. You see this? This is supposedly their Higgs event that they big touted that they found. But they're shooting particles like this against another one like that. And they're just getting big globs of things spinning all over the place. We did it with light. So we, have, we don't see all this debris. We just see the actual particles, the smallest ones. You see this? You should be able to see this. That's the Higgs from CERN. It's just a bunch of garbage. The same thing here. Just trash. Literally trash. That's all they see is this. And then they dig through it. They know the blues take off and go and never come back again. And the yellow and the green normally do as well. The red just sort of hangs around because it's not held to so tightly that it has enough energy to escape. And we find the exact same thing. There's no question it's the same. Now, we also see the Higgs fields here. These are actual Higgs fields. And this was done with this phone. It's nothing more than a Samsung Galaxy S3. It's 10 years old, more than that. And this is what we took with. And this that's because this is CMOS. CMOS, all we do is receive the light. We don't interfere with anything. We are picking up the photons that are being emitted. When CERN and Fermilab were doing their research, they were shooting something into it to make it excited so they could see it, or they were putting something inside the stream, which is called charge coupled, and they would extract some of the energy. So they said, well, if we look at it, it changes. No, it's because you're changing it. You're either adding energy or you're subtracting energy. That's all. We didn't do anything. We just sat out here and watched for the light. Okay, I, I was deep into electronics my whole life, and I went to the University of Geneva online, um, and I discussed our, my stuff with them, and they were, you know, they're always talking about this observer effect. Every time they look at it, something changes. The only reason it changes is because they're adding energy or taking some away. And I said, we're using CMOS to just let it absorb the energy that's coming out. We're not interfering whatsoever. And they said, you can't do that. You'll destroy the um, the um, CMOS receiver. And I said, no, we're using light. It's designed to pick up a particle of light. That's what it's for. But it's not designed to pick up a chunk like that. And that's what they're shooting out. Like they get all kind of things going and it destroyed the CMOS. So here's what they ended up doing. This work focuses on the design and integration of novel radiation hard monolithic CMOS pixel sensors. This was in 2019 they did the upgrade. Now I went to like I say 2017 or so and I said well you can you're not going to interfere with it using CMOS which is what we use and and um, and this is just ended up happening 
They shut down for three years. In 2019, they did that. And then they also focused. Before, they weren't focusing enough. And you, what happens is because these have a big field, like a basketball surrounding a tiny little particle, they bounce off. So they never really hit particle to particle. The only way you can do is to have them focus so tight together they can't get away. There's no, they're going to get hit. And, and they're still not going to get hit a ton of times. They increased a, a lot more, but nothing like we're doing. We're getting every single one of them to collide. 100%. All right, what I showed you was the highest luminosity you could ever get. CERN and the LHC, to explore new frontiers, they had to upgrade, upgrade to focus. They required new types of magnets to focus the beams of protons. Before, they were, they were focusing. They were just hoping something would hit. You know, they were focusing a little bit, not like they're doing it now. So I told them, I said, the only way we can do this is to focus them so tightly that there's, there's no way that they can get away from each other. If they're just hitting, slide, they're going to slide off like this in the air. They have to be so tightly focused when they hit together, there's no way for them to get away from each other. Then you're going to get the collision that they're hoping to get, which is to explode these particles into the tiniest bits that exist. But they're still using these huge particles, still seeing nothing but trash. And this, I told them about this, you have to focus and you have to use CMOS or you're never going to get anywhere. And they did both of those things. I know, I'm bragging, yes. But my boss used to say, if it's true, it ain't bragging. And it is true. I went to the University of Geneva, I told them all about this stuff. That was, I think, 2016, somewhere around or 2017. And then 2019, they... Did the upgrade. Okay, my friends, finally getting somewhere. Fundamental physics uncovered experiments prove existence of a new type of magnetism. At this moment, they do not understand electricity, electrons, protons, any, any, any of the stuff that's inside there. Now, they're talking about spintronics and all this stuff. And then they get down here. This is the part that excites me. It says, now that we have brought it to light, many people around the world will be able to work on it. Yes, I'm going to show you what they should be working on right now. Okay, this gets a little bit detailed, not much. Electrons are the white particles. Muons are the black particles. I'm going to show you in a second. And the two of them are glued together, and they call them gluons. The black particle never changes. It's a fixed particle. The white one can get big, it can get small, and it has no weight whatsoever that I can determine. If you take two of these back to back, like it, all this is is a bar magnet, and it's the tiniest little bar magnet that exists. It's from light. Well, this is actually an electron. They call it a gluon. You take two of them back to back, and it's a photon. A photon hits something, it bounces back. An electron hits something, it sticks into it. That's what electricity is, is that. When you have two of them together, you have a field surrounding it, and it bounces. This only has a field here, and it wants to glue into something. It wants to snap in. Now, th there's going to be some differences between the standard model and dipole electron flood theory, which in the standard model, they say that the protons and neutrons... Well, here, let me show you the standard model. Don't forget. This particle is this tiny, tiny, tiny little white particle, has all the energy. The black one never changes size, has no, it's, a, it's dark matter. It is, this is the dark matter. It has no, it doesn't reflect, it doesn't absorb, it doesn't emit. All it does is it attracts like crazy the white ones. This is a, such a strong attraction, it takes literally tons, tons of force to remove that white from the black. That's from, I believe it was Lawrence Lizardmore, it may have been Jefferson Labs, just the other day, they released that. They said they've discovered it takes tons of energy to pull the white away from the black. That's why electricity is so, so unbelievably powerful. All right, basically this is what you have to think about on a standard model, is they have two huge, huge, huge particles. They look like tiny, tiny particles, but no, they are actually, each one of these is about 1823 for the proton, 1824 neutral for the neutron. 
they slam these things together and they get all this debris. They get chunks, which now they're real excited about, these X particles, because they're just big blobs. There's nothing more than big blobs of, of partial pieces of the protons. And then they get down to where we are in the light realm, into the photons, and then into the tiny little particles. But they still see it as a zoo of particles because it's just nothing more than debris. We started down in this range. We started with the tiniest little particles that exist. So we end up being able to see the exact situation instead of a pile of debris. Okay, don't forget, we're going to get back to the nine mind blower experiments in a minute because I haven't seen it yet. We'll do it together. But I showed you what our particles are. And here they are right here. Same ones the Fermilab found. Identical. No difference whatsoever. Zero difference. Only we can split them by applying tons of energy to it. And how do we do it? For free. What does that mean? We didn't use any energy whatsoever to do this. We restricted the black from getting through the slot. We just use a single slit. The double slit is, forget that, That's, it was really nonsense. Here's what we did. And Rod Warren came up with this just accidentally. It was just a godsend, to be honest with you. But it was, it's been rejected. And I don't know why. This is the wave, which is a particle in a wave. That's always, and again, they're going to show in that, that video, he's going to be talking about particle in a wave. I got up to that point and I said, eh, I'm just going to do a video about the whole thing. Here's the wave. Well, here's the particle. The particle has a field surrounding it. So the particle inside the field, this tiny little particle, has to make that wave of magnetism push every other magnetic wave out of its way. So these little bitty waves are, you know, they're, they're just getting a little tiny glow because they're getting pushed out of the way. This is accelerating now because of a venturi. And a venturi is a restriction that is so fine that it only, well in this case it's so fine, it's tuned to only allow the white to come through. The black has to stay this side. Can't get through. Simple as that. So we have done what the a generator and all these devices, the windmills and solar things and all that to drive electrons. We just put a laser with a very low energy because you can see there's very little energy. Energy is luminosity. All right, think about this for a second. Let your mind understand this. Energy is field crushing. That's what energy is. It's a field against another field. That's what energy is. When that happens, you get glow or you get sound. All right, you get vibration. Well, this is vibration on steroids. That is, that's a a First of all, it's a pulse red laser, and it's the, the black is slamming the hell out of that white, and that white can get through. The black can't. So this is the this is the cool thing about this, and I don't see why we can't get free energy right now today. It literally went in weeks. We should be able to have these things working. All right, we're going to go through the spectrum and all this business about visible light and gamma rays and X rays and what the difference is and the energy levels and so forth. But these are the only two particles that exist. The only two that exist. And 1,823 of those attached together, 1,823 of them, make up what they consider to be a proton. All right? That's not what a proton is. It consists of a couple of little quarks and stuff. My proton is this. All right? So this is an anatomy of a proton, dipole electron flood theory, my theory. Now, what is in the core of a proton? is the dark matter. And it is literally, literally the dark matter. Surrounding that dark matter is the same number of particles, but they're white and they're glowy and they're glued on there. I mean, they are stuck on there like crazy. Now, they're really stuck on the blue ones. They're very, very close to the black. Let me just show that a little. 
better up here. Now, because there's two different styles possibly of the proton in my world. The first one is all the black goes to the center and then all of the white goes around it. And depending upon how big that core is, is the number of white ones around it. Now, there's areas that are called atoms and they're stable at certain quantities. I believe it has something to do with the hum of the universe, vibrating them into a certain pattern. Because if you ever watch the salt table experiments, they go, and it locks in. And then they go, and it locks in again. You know, I should show you that because, well, let's take a look at it in a second. But this is my proton. All of those are electrons surrounding the same number but they're in the core, and that's the dark matter. So we have never seen into the core of a proton. You never saw that in the core. So you never saw the dark matter. That's why they can't find it. It's in amongst the things that we see that bounce back at us, which are the, the white particles. Those are the ones only ones that bounce back. And they're, every one of them you can think of as being white. And why do some of them come back green, some of them come back blue, come back red, or all those other colors? It's the speed of this coming back at. So it depends on how fast you're shooting it. If it's a red one and you're banging it against something, you know, you're probably not going to get much more than red back. You're not going to get up into the blue and the green because it just doesn't have enough energy to bounce back that high. But when you whack it with blue, you're going to get a real good. And when you hit it with all, all of the colors at the same time, the red, the blue, the green, all these different frequencies, which is white light, you're going to get a glow of all the different colors because you have used all the different frequencies. But it's only light spinning and it's the tighter the spin, which means it had to be pulled away really hard from the core to get out spinning that fast. The, the red, red ones are on the outside and they sort of hang around and they actually, that's what they show with Fermilab or CERN, whatever, here, here, here. The red ones are on the outside, so they're sort of, they're not tightly held enough so that when they take off, they can just keep hanging around. <laughs> but the red, the other ones, they're so tight down at the bottom, boom, when they go, they, they're not coming back. All right, so don't forget, this is, what happens is light spins, and I can absolutely show you 100% for certain that's true. They think it might flap. They don't really know. They think it flaps like this, and they see it as a wave. If you look at that, you would say that's a wave. It's going up and down, up and down. But that's because you're looking sideways. If you look at it that way, it's spinning right at you. And I will show you that actually happening from light. You see that? That's about as good of an example as you can get. It's spinning. Sometimes it spins off that way. Sometimes it spins off this way. It's spinning so fast and there's so many of them hitting here. There's some over here, some over here, some over here, some over here. As I showed you, they're going to be all over the place. But some will end up going this way, and some will end up going this way. And that's what gives you this actual drill bit. You talk to any machinist, they'll say, yeah, that's a drill bit. That's what happens with a drill bit. Now, light spins. Let's just let's get off that case. Now, just so you know, this is Fermi Labs. I, I showed this a million times. We have the exact same identical particles, and they do the exact same thing. The white one, I mean the black one, is extended fixed particle. Never changes size. It has a fuzzy edge, which is the color, and the point-like particle are mathematical extract abstractions. And I can't account for them either. They have a hell of a lot of energy, but they have no weight to them whatsoever. And it's exactly as zero size particles. I don't disagree with that, and I, tr I concurred with, uh, you know, talked with Don Lincoln about this, and he thinks I'm crazy. And um, I'm showing his identical particles, and I'm showing how we produce them, and I can show the photons, and I think it deserves a look by Fermilab, CERN, all the rest of them. If they're spending our money to do this, I, I expect them to take a look at this. So don't forget, one more time before we get too deep into it, I just showed you Fermilab. There it is right there. Those are the parts. That's, that's it. You can't deny it. It's undeniable. And here are they stuck together in their normal atomic configuration, subatomic. They're so tight together, you can't rip those apart. Tons to rip them apart. We did it by forcing the white to, the black literally smashed the white through the 
then that's really what happened. I could show you that happening too. Here it is right here. You see the black right there? That black is, this is another one. The first one I just showed you, the other Venturi, was tuned to a point that only the white could get through. Here we got all kind of black coming through too. Not a whole lot, but mostly the white, and then the, but the black comes through with it. Now you can see the black pushes the white. Well, if we had a little tiny slot right there, just a tiny, tiny slot, that the black was too big. The black is this big. And if we had a slot this big, it's going to keep slamming the white through. Boom, boom, boom. The white is just going to keep going. And the black just going to bounce back. And what happens? Did we ever see that happen? Well, yes, we did. Right there. All right, here's the black. Boom, 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 boom. The slit is like, like a hair over here. It's like a hair compared to that ball. You see that? Pay close attention. All right, think about this very carefully. That particle is coming down here. It was the black and the whites all balled up together, tighter than hell. Well, slam, slam, slam. This has weight. This pushes the white. I just showed you it pushing the white. Well, the white can get through. So it goes, pew, 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 and he says, well, I can't get through. So get out of the way. Let some more white come through, and it just squirts it out of here. Now, what happens on the other side? In this particular Venturi, there was absolutely no white, zero, I mean, no black, zero. But the black wants to get in just as quick as it can, and this is as quick as it could naturally by this slowing down and having enough room to accept the black. Let's call it that. Now, the only way you can, the only reason that we see this black at all. You would never, ever, 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 ever see that because that's what dark matter is. This, is. this is dark matter. And the only reason we see it because it's obstructing the white. We should be able to see the white glow everywhere around here. Well, wherever the black balls are on top of it, you don't see the white. The black has no problem being right on top of each other. That's why I say the core, the black, it doesn't push, it doesn't shove. It, 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 I mean, it does push. It does all those other things, but it, it doesn't glow. It, do, and it doesn't reflect. It doesn't absorb. And it doesn't emit. It attracts. This is gravity. The dark particle is gravity. That's what they've been looking for their whole lives. And they just didn't realize that a white, which is they always thought was just an electron, is attached to the black part. And that's what gives the electron its weight. And you know there's weight on electrons and light just due to a Crookes radiometer. When you shine that on there, you make that sucker spin. And nobody understands how it works either. I do. I've, I've studied this very carefully. I understand why this thing spins in what they would consider opposite to what they had expected. They expected the white to go that way when you shine light on it, but it doesn't. You shine light on it, on this, and you shine, it doesn't matter. You hit this, it'll spin the black going this way. It just happens that I twisted it and now it was spinning this way, but if I put light on, watch. Hold on. All right, I'm going to do it with a laser, a little tiny laser. But you can't do it with the uh, green. The green doesn't have enough power. Watch. If I shine it at that black, you see it? There's not enough energy in the green to push that. Now watch this. This is, a, this is the blue laser. Watch what happens with the blue. This has energy. You see? Now white would make this thing go flying. But blue does a pretty good job. The blue will keep it going. But if I shine the blue on the white, it doesn't do anything. It's not pushing it backwards. You would expect it to start spinning backwards. And it doesn't. Nobody's ever been able to explain that. 
And if you put this in, in freezing water or, or in, in a cold, spray some condensed air on there, which is cold, it'll spin backwards. The white will go that way. Light will make it go this way. Cold will make it go that way. And heat is the same thing. And heat and light is the same thing. Heat is the same as light, only it's just slower. That's all. It's, it, 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 heat is down here. All right, red light is up in here somewhere. Green is up in here. Blue is like way up here. And then you shed all the white particles that are spin have flown off, and all you have is the black particle left. And then you are up here, past the ultraviolet catastrophe. That's what it's called, ultraviolet catastrophe. Right there, it loses all the white particles, and it has no more energy to be hot. So it goes hotter, 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 and pfft, it drops right off to nothing. And they can't understand that. So why, why would that happen? There's no white particles left. There's no white ones left. It spun so fast that all the white ones took off. And what's left is the black ones and the gamma rays, because they don't care about it. You know, for them, it's no problem. They just keep going. But the white ones are, are energetically thrown away. And at this point, you're into ionizing radiation. Non-ionizing just means it's not driving particles off of anything. Ionizing means all you've got left is the black particles, and they're going to knock the white ones out. Very simple to understand if you pay attention. Okay, I got a white light here. What's the difference between a white light and all these other colored lights, the green laser and so forth? White has all, all the frequencies in the spectrum, all the way across. So it bounces back all of that stuff. Now watch this. I am going to shine it directly at the white. You see that? I'm basically only hitting the white. It's drawing it towards it. It's drawing the white towards the light. Alright, sorry about the interruption, but here, I showed you I shined the white light on the white side, and it came towards the white light. It's certainly not pushing it. All I'm hitting right now is that white. Watch, watch what happens. It'll come towards. You see it coming towards me? Now watch. This time I'm going to hit the black. Watch what happens now. All right, so it, either shooting the, at the black or the white doesn't matter. It, the white doesn't come as quick. The black goes like crazy. Why does that happen? I want you to think about this kind of stuff yourself. And nobody can account for this. 150 years, they have no idea why this is happening. None. There's good theories, and none of them, you know, talk transpiration and all this stuff. I know why it's happening, just to be honest with you. And it's got to do with the glass. Nobody's taking that into account. All right, so now this is where you say, oh, Roger, how could it have anything to do with the glass? Why, why would it have anything to do with the glass? The light shining through the glass. Same light shining through the same glass. And you have a white side and you have a black side and they do different things. And why would the temperature cause that? Well, here's the deal. If you're on this side of the glass and the sun is shining on you and you're right here on this side of the glass and the sun is shining down, you will get a sunburn. If you're on the other side of the glass and the sun is shining down on you, you won't get a sunburn. <laughs> Explain that one to me. Okay, now, this is where it gets a lot of fun. I love this stuff. We're shining light, which is composed of these two particles. And they have two completely, totally different types of attitudes towards life. This one just says, I'm just going to go. I don't care what's in front of me. I'm just going to keep going. And this one says, well, I'm going to bounce off things. Well, if the light is bright enough, it's going to get all the way through that glass. The black doesn't care. It's going to go all the way through. It doesn't care. It doesn't matter pretty much. I mean, you can get thick enough where it's going to slow it down, but a thin glass like this, it's just going to keep going right through there. But the white is not going to all go through. So you're going to have more black going through than white. 
That's why you don't get the sunburn here, because the white is what gives you the sunburn. The white will hit you out here and get a sunburn. On the other side of the glass, not all the white is coming through, but almost all the black will be. So why would that cause this reaction? Only dipole electron flood theory can solve any of these issues. And it solves every single one of them, 100%. Gravity, dark matter, Crookes radiometer even, a toy. Okay, so you, you realize that the, the, the standard model of atomic physics is just not correct, and everybody knows that. So they're looking for whatever they can come up with, and here's something, there are new fundamental physics uncovered experiments, a new type of magnetism. I looked into this, and there's nothing new here. Now, this is what I wanted to do today, but it, we're running a little long here. I'm just going to start it out and listen to what he has to say. This is Astrum. They, they do some really good stuff. And um, I, I, I don't know if it's going to be loud or too loud or what. Here we go. Listen to this. Uh, hold on. I'm probably going to have a commercial. Hold on. Yep, I was right. Okay, here we go. There is much of science that we understand. If I threw a ball into the air and was given the right data about the forces acting on it, I could tell you exactly where it would land. Science explains through chemistry the molecules that make the ball up. We can predict the energy levels of the sound it would make when it lands. Much like a candle being held up in the dark, science illuminates our view of the world around us. But there is a limit to how far the light currently falls. Even today, when it feels like there is so much of the world and the universe that we can explain, there is darkness too. Answers we don't have yet, and worse, confusing results that erode our confidence in what we think we do know. There are experiments that seem to suggest that light is lying to us and call into question the very nature of reality. Are we real? Is time linear? Perhaps not. But I got to be honest with you, that's the kind of stuff. You know, that's really on the edge of... It. I'm a material scientist guy. I showed you all the stuff I'm showing you. Now, let's see what they have to say. So, I, I'm not going with everything about where maybe we're not real, maybe we're times, whatever. Here it goes. But are you ready for the comforting veil of understanding to be torn away, and for the strangeness at the edges of our understanding to be brought into the light? If so, I have some experiments for you. I'm Alex McColgan, and you're watching Astrum. And in today's Supercut, I will show you nine experiments that will challenge your understanding of the fundamental laws of physics in a way that will almost certainly leave you with something between a headache and existential dread. You have been warned. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, you have been warned. <laughs> now, here's the deal. This is running a lot longer than I thought. He's going to start with the double slit experiment. I showed you the single slit experiment we had, but I'm going to let I'm going to go through each one of these as the experiment and the way they explain it, and then I'm going to explain it the way I explain it. And it's going to just take too much time today. So I showed you a lot of stuff today, and that should give you a good background in material physics. Not this, oh, we must do this, and it has to do that, and we know it's a this, and we think it's that, and everybody knows it, and this is a constant, and this is a law. No. There is no laws. There's no constants. There's nothing that we know. There's only what we can see and observe and deduce. And that's what we will do in relationship to what they, in academic physics, currently think. That's what I do. I just go against everything. <laughs> no, I just, I, I just want reality. I just want to be able to discuss it. You can't discuss something. I got all this. This is not nothing. This is not nothing. This is something. That's nothing. That's nothing. That's nothing. None of my stuff. And here's the one, I, I don't think I showed you this, here's the red and the green going through the same venture at the same time. The red just gets pushed out of the way, very weak compared to the green. And the only difference is the spin. The red is coming through like this. The green is coming through like this. And the blue, hold on, have I got a blue shot here? 
Yeah, here's the blue. Same thing with the blue. And the blue is just rocket ship fast. You can't even see there's two particles here until you get way out here and it's slowed down. So light slows down, light speeds up. What I have just shown you completely changes everything in physics. It changes everything in physics, 100%. Things aren't made of gigantic protons and neutrons and quarks and all that little stuff. They're made of the particles that I showed you, the dipole electron th flood theory particles. Right here. That's the only two particles that make up everything, the particles that make up the nucleus. These two together, and there's the same equal number, as I believe. Now, when you get into isotopes, that's a different story. You got isotopes, and they go all up and down the chart. Isotopes are all over the place. So if you take, and I've shown this again, I've shown this stuff many, many times, but I'm going to just keep showing until it takes hold. But you take carbon. Carbon is not just carbon. Carbon has all kinds of isotopes, and there's, which means they have extra electrons. So you have your core. Here's, here's an isotope. This will make it easy. This will make it very, very simple. You have an atom, which is these, and it's stable, it's carbon, and it has six protons, six neutrons, and six electrons is what they say. I say no. It has that number of pieces, but they are each times 1823 or so. So this has figure um, 12 times or 10 times 2,000. Right, so this has got 20,000 particles in a ball like this. Now, that's the stable one. That's carbon-12, and exactly at 12 is stable. All right, so 12 times 1823, that's the size of this. Now, what if I took five of these away? Well, it's still carbon. But it's, it's an isotope of carbon. It means it doesn't have enough electrons that it normally wants to be stable. So it will have a half-life. It'll last a certain distance of time, and then it'll grab into some more electrons, and it'll become whole again and become stable. Now, if we had this thing in a real hot situation, boiling or whatever, or irradiated it, you would be throwing in a whole batch of extra electrons. That goes above carbon-12, carbon-13, 14, 15, 16, and that just means there's extra particles surrounding here that they, they don't want. They don't want them all there. They want 12. 12 is stable. Too many is too many. Not enough is not enough. 12 is exactly what you want. When they get below, it's, it's from some kind of boiling or heating or radiation or whatever. When they get above in the electrons, it's a different situation. It's more chemistry-oriented. When they get below in electrons, it's um, it's more irradiation, it's heat, and it's it's uh, pulling particles off. When you're pushing particles in, normally I would say, normally it's it's chemistry that's pushing those extra particles to attach there. All right, I, I just got to at least show you this last bit, and I haven't seen this yet either. They're going to be talking about C, which is the constant of the speed of light. I just showed you undeniable evidence that you can speed light up and you can slow light down, and light is made of all these particles. I, this What I have shown you is material evidence. I'm not showing you little guesses and things like this. Let's see what it, what they have to say. And I respect Astro a lot. And he's trying to figure this out. And he's a smart guy. So let's see what, what he's got to say about the speed of light. And that's what's destroyed physics forever. The speed of light's not constant. And that means the redshift isn't working the way they say either. They say the redshift is because the planets are going away or all the space is expanding. So it's pulling the light and making it look red to us. It's not. It's coming in like this and slowing down, just like that blue particle I showed you. Light is just slowing down. This redshift nonsense is crazy. Space is saturated with fields and particles. It's called a quantum foam. As a matter of fact, let me show you so you don't get lost. See, this is Fermilab again, the same ones I showed of the particles. Empty space isn't empty. 
empty space experiences a similar activity to the head of a root beer, subatomic particles winking in and out of existence. Blink, 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 blink. These particles, subatomic particles, are real and have a measurable impact on our universe. That is exactly correct. And here's, the, th this is what's in our universe. Look at this. These are all magnetic fields. You go through a magnetic field and you have resistance. It's called magnetic resistance. So you have to push your light through all this stuff. You're going to slow down. And this, this, is, this was Rod Warren's nephew, Dylan, Dylan Carpenter. And, um, and I haven't had any contact with either one of them for years now. And I, I don't know what exactly happened, but he, Rod worked with me and did a fabulous job. And then Dylan just sent me these pictures and just walked away from, for whatever reason, I don't know. It's up to them to do it or not. And, but, but uh, you know, he, <laughs> it's just stunning what's being done and not being seen by anybody. You know, I've been pushing this, and I've been pushed back at it so hard. Anytime I show this stuff, oh, the guy's crazy, he's a whack job. Da, 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 da. Well, I am showing material evidence and being assaulted like unbelievable. And that's maybe why they got away from it, because, you know, you, you experience assaults. If you see something, you think you see something, you ask about it, and it, 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 you, you can't ask about it because it goes against what everybody else thinks. You know, I could have walked away from this 15 years ago, but I said, no, I got, I got the evidence. And then I was so stunned at the pushback, even to today, to this very day. It doesn't matter what evidence you have. There is no evidence that will be accepted by people that have their minds closed. And that's what we have right now is a closed-minded society. They have congregated into little clumps of matter that stay away from us. We got a membrane around us and you stay that side, we're going to stay in here. That's what's happened today, my friends. Now, this has gone on a little longer than I expected. So let's, uh, let's do the last bit of here with the speed of light, the constant. Let me just make sure we don't have a commercial. Hold on. All right, check this out. This is good because it keeps exhibiting elements of both, seemingly unable to settle. Bizarrely, it behaves one way when you're looking at it, but a different way when you're not. See, that's wrong. But at least its speed is consistent. Nope. Light travels at the speed of light. No matter your frame of reference, that one thing remains the same. I have some bad news for you. It turns out the constancy of light speed might not be right either, and the next few experiments I'm about to show you proves it. Light might go slower than physics would predict in certain circumstances. And no, I'm not just talking about light slowing down in denser mediums like glass, although that's what I originally intended this video to be about. We have an explanation for that. I'm saying that in some circumstances, light seems to travel a path through time and space that has it either going slower or faster than the speed of light, even if dense mediums aren't present. All right, when he says dense mediums, normally you shoot it through some dense particles, it's, it's going to slow it down. That's understood. But they say space is a vacuum. There's nothing out there. That's just ridiculous. Absolutely ridiculous. It's saturated with particles. That's the problem. They don't pay attention to the, what's, out, what's real. But the really weird thing is that it ends up at the same destination in space and time anyway. Let me show you what I mean. Light travels at 299,792,458 meters per second. According to relativity, this is the only speed light can travel at, and interestingly, seems to stick to that number regardless of your frame of reference. To That's just basically ridiculous. I just showed you. There's no question whatsoever. We sped it up and slowed it down. Two people could be traveling through space, one at 1% the speed of light and the other at 50% the speed of light. But if they both look at the same beam of propagating photons, they will see them traveling at the same speed. 
time and distance would seemingly rather warp than allow you to see anything other than light traveling at light speed. Of course, when scientists say this, they are only talking about light traveling in a vacuum. Exactly. <laughs> All right, so the, the, here's what's going on. They're only talking about a vacuum. There's no of course, vacuum. When scientists say this, they are only talking about light traveling in a vacuum. We've known for a long time that as soon as you get matter involved, light gets bogged down Slows and travels down. slower. Light traveling in air only goes at 299,705,000 meters per second, a full 87,458 meters per second slower than light in a vacuum. Light in water goes around 225 million meters per second. Light going through glass caps out at around 200 million. All right, I showed you before. I say that that Crookes radiometer is a product of the glass absorbing some of the energy. Now, it, it, this is, I, I'm going to have to go through this in, in enough detail so that, that there's no, no missing my, my claims and no missing their claims. He's talking about all of these different, different um, speeds of light and so forth, and he's, he's, he's a detailed guy. And this is 51 minutes long, so this is going to be take some time to do. So I'm breaking it up from here. We're going to go into this, and I'm going to take one piece at a time. He's got nine experiments that will blow your mind and change your view of light. Well, I think if you were a physicist or you had any any dealing with this kind of stuff, I, I, I would hope I've changed your mind already. <laughs> because your mind should change the things that we've been, been taught and thought were just wrong. And this even shows the Russians have created a black hole in space. This goes back 10 years ago almost. And uh, a lot of them just don't know what they're doing. Look at that. That's Rod's nephew, Dylan, took this picture with his new cell phone. This was a couple of years ago. And this looks like the Seven Sisters. There's four, five, six, seven. And they look like they're this side of the moon to me. I don't know what's going on here, but these are these gravity waves and these, these reactive waves that surround reactive particles. As I have shown you, or didn't, maybe I didn't show you this, but this is serious. And, and everything has to go through this. Not only through that, there's all the dust. These are magnetic fields. These are fields that oppose other fields. But in addition to that, space is saturated with particles. Even John Glenn, when he went up into space, the first time he went up in space and went around the globe, as he was in the dark side of, the, of things, all right, and the sun was shining past here and shining past here. He could look out this way and see all these little things lit up all over. He called them fireflies. But once he got out into the sun, he couldn't see them anymore because they were, he was amongst them. Now, same thing when he was here in the darkness here. He's in the, the dark and the light's coming past here. He could look back and see them all glowing all over the place back there because they're just nothing more than dust particles. And we're saturated with that. Absolutely saturated with it. And light is particles itself. I just showed you this. Now, I would like some discussion on this rather than to have me be told I'm a tinfoil hat guy and don't ever contact us again, which is what I got. So let's, uh, you know, I'm going to go through these other experiments. I'm showing detailed information with material evidence, experiments. That is, I'm not showing little doodles. And that's what I see all the time. I see these kind of doodles. Well, we are, oh boy, wow, oh boy, we, we know what we're doing now. We've got a big doodle. Well, I don't see that. I don't see that as being anything f f fancy, to be honest with you. I see the one they did at Fermi Lab being pretty, pretty good. He, they're showing the exact same particles we showed. So, if I didn't change your mind about physics, subatomic physics, then your mind is stuck and it's never going to get changed. Because what I just showed you, 
unmistakable, undeniable, can't be refuted. It's just true. But it, it's been denied to be examined. That's the problem. This is what really annoys me about science. It's not that there's, there's no science. It's that there's no ability to, to get the science out to people. I have people giving me stuff all the time. Fabulous stuff. Like even Rod. Rod did this. Nobody would know about this. Rod never could have, he would never stuck into this like I did. He, I mean, he did. He worked with me fabulously, but I pushed this stuff as hard as I could. And and finally, you know, everybody walks away sooner or later. You, you get nowhere. And I haven't gotten anywhere really either. But I think now it's starting to trickle around. And especially I, I'm seen as a nutcase because of the mud fossil stuff. And uh, that's all proven too. DNA tests, CAT scans, specimens, undeniable. And uh, that's, the, that's the realm of science we're in. And like Max Planck said, science advances one funeral at a time. These guys that are in charge got to get the hell out of the way. Otherwise, they're just preying on your children. They've already preyed on mine. All right, I love you all. Let's try to find some truth and reality.